Hey everybody, welcome back to these uh, Bible study videos. We're so glad you're here. We're coming up now on the last two videos of our Jesus A to Z series. We're using some of the theme videos from the Bible Project uh, to show how the work of God to save his beloved children through his son Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit is really not a New Testament invention. It's operative from Genesis all the way to Revelation. This was always God's first and only plan to save his people. So I hope you enjoy these next two videos. And please stay tuned because our next series is going to look at the Torah or the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses, as we really see uh, the, the person and the work of Christ through God's grace in those stories as well. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place. But then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but what is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you got to clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. <sighs> so you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply, that too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophet saw it. While God's ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes, and the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story is saying that God's spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the Spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. And so today, the Spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the Spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to our Bible study series, Jesus A to Z. We're looking at some of the theme videos uh, that have been put out by this wonderful art collective organization in Portland called The Bible Project. Those theme videos trace 
uh, the work of God the Father through Jesus' Son by the Holy Spirit from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus and his person and work as the center of God's um, unthwartable plan of redemption from A to Z. So thanks for being back with us today. And the video you've just watched is called The Holy Spirit. I wrote down in my notes because I'm trying to be funny and I'm not funny. Uh, Holy Spirit, Batman. I just kind of like imagine this uh, Batman Robin old school comic, you know, pow, punch, boom, wham. Uh, the Holy Spirit. Who the heck is the Holy Spirit? I, I feel like in, in many of our churches, and I'm guilty of this as well, you know, we sort of understand God the Father. We, we surely think a lot and talk a lot about Jesus Christ, the Son. But what is the Holy Spirit? <laughs> we know that God is one God in, in three persons. And each of these uh, three persons are, are, are fully God. Uh, they're co-equal with distinct roles, as it were. And again, we, we seem to know a good bit about the roles of the Father, you know, creator, sustainer, sovereign king of the universe, and the Son, you know, redeemer, Messiah, Christ. But what about the Spirit? And I think there's a few helpful ways to think about that, um, but perhaps to make it personal before we begin, I, I think that's important to do, uh, to make it personal for us and to make it practical. How can we apply this to our own life change and transformation and being sent by God on mission out to love our neighbors uh, through what we learn in these studies. We're told in the video that the Holy Spirit is essentially the personal presence of God. And so uh, I just would like us to think, I mean, wh what do we know about that? Um, do we feel that? Do we believe that? Do we see God's personal presence active within our own life? In the same way as the, the wind is invisible, but we see it moving the leaves, uh, do we see the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, sanctifying us? Now, that's a big Christian word, which means to be made holy, but in that sense, to be set apart, meaning changing us, growing us. And, you know, sometimes that happens really slowly over a long period of time. It often happens in the middle of great challenges and trials, as we see in the life of King David in Psalm 23. But I think it's fair to ask, do we see and know and feel the personal presence of God in our lives? Um, do we see it at work in the way that we love God and love our neighbors? Um, do we want more of it? And I'm not asking this question to heap up you know, sadness or guilt upon you, but that together we might have some, some really practical ways to pursue that presence and see the reality of it uh, perhaps hidden to us as it already exists in our life as believers. So again, God the Father is a creator and sustainer, King and Lord, uh, Jesus the Redeemer, and the Spirit, the role of the Spirit in the Scriptures is really is the one who applies uh, the, the, the commands and decrees of God exercised through the work of His Son to us, His children. The, the Spirit applies all the redemption of Christ and all the benefits that flow out of that redemption to us. And it's important to note that the Spirit is always at work in creation and new creation. God is making all things new. God will one day, thank you Jesus, make all the sad things come untrue. And the way that the Lord is going to do that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the full energy of God's essence, his nature, his character, his attributes applied not just to individual human hearts, but to the church as a whole, right? Revelation 19, we're told that the church will be like a bride washed white and spotless and, and Christ the bridegroom will receive her. But indeed, the entire creation, Paul tells us that the creation is groaning. And I think this is really cool because when you think about heaven, again, it's not just floating babies and organ solos. Heaven will be a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation that will be brought to us by the power and work, the making all things new work of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit itself is present in creation. Uh, we're told that the Spirit hovers over the waters. It's interesting, if you read Genesis, those early chapters in particular, one through three, you really do see uh, the, the presence of the Trinity there, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Um, God says, let us make them in our own image. And I know there's a variety of interpretations to the plural there, but of course, for those of us who are in Christ, we can see that one God in three persons is already working from the very, very beginning of time. What does the Spirit do in creation? Well, He takes what is chaotic, the mountains, the seas, the eruptions, the craziness, and He brings order out of it. So there's this great little Hebrew turn of phrase, tohu vavohu, all right? You can use this at your next dinner party. The earth was tohu vavohu, formless and void, right? Chaotic and disordered and the spirit of God, the the personal presence and energy of God, redemptive and recreating energy comes upon this earth, this matter, this clay and takes what is formless and void and forms it into something glorious and beautiful that reflects the perfection and the nature of God himself. From tohu to glory, that's the work of the Spirit. That's the work of the Spirit in our lives, the personal presence of God. And so we have this word that we learned in the video, ruach. I won't try to say it with with too much accent, um, since this is going to be on the interwebs. But again, in Hebrew, wind, breath, Spirit, And this is not only the personal presence, but the personal active presence of God, the presence of God that actually does something. And this energy, this power that is the Spirit of God, completely reflects and is in line with the essence of God, again, His nature. So wherever the Spirit is, we're told, there is freedom. Why? Because wherever the Holy Spirit, the energy of God is present, it's driving out uh, the chains and the shackles of our sin. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Indeed, Paul says to Timothy, the young leader, the young pastor who's trying to be a good pastor and he's got all kinds of issues in his church in Ephesus, Paul says, Timothy, don't you know God hasn't given us a a spirit of fear, but a a spirit of, of power to drive away fear. God's perfect love applied through his personal presence and energy, drives away fear. You are free. You have nothing to worry about. Now, apply this to your life. Where do you not have freedom? Where are you overcome right now by fear or anxiety or trials or challenges? The Spirit of God wants to provide for you and bless you with with this kind of freedom because the Spirit wants to apply to you all the promises that are already for you and fulfilled for you in Jesus Christ, so that now you are, as the scripture says, hidden with Christ in God, so that when God looks down upon you, he sees the finished work of his own son, and he sees you and me as adopted children into this new family of which Jesus is the first fruits and the eldest brother. That is really good news. Now, in the video, we were given a few Old Testament examples where the the Spirit does act and apply this very form of new and recreative empowerment as it applies the the ongoing work of God's grace to his people. In the Old Testament, the Spirit is pushing forward the history of redemption to get us to Christ. So we see in Joseph that he is empowered to have and interpret these dreams. But the dreams aren't arbitrary. They're not out of nowhere. Remember that these dreams are the very thing that allowed Joseph to Uh, you know, have favor with Pharaoh and eventually reconcile with his family, eventually bring Israel into Egypt. And eventually that leads to Moses, that leads to their freedom. This all pushes the new creation story of God forward. Now, I love the the guy he mentioned, Basil. Uh, This is a character that you should really uh, look up or spend some time reading about. Uh, There's a Lutheran sort of philosopher, theologian guy named Gene Veith who wrote a really great book on the power and importance of art in the life of the Christian believer and how art and good art has always been a part of the Christian tradition. And indeed, uh, where the spirit is, there will be beauty making and art. So we get this guy in the Old Testament who's essentially tasked with designing uh, and beautifying the interior of the tabernacle. Now, I I could go into all sorts of details about what that design looks like and how he's receiving the word from the Lord about how to do that and then adding his artistic touch. But here's the point. The inside of the tabernacle is actually filled with trees and fruit and beauty. What is going on here? (laughs) What's going on is that the inside of the tabernacle where atonement is made, where God's presence is, is there, where heaven and earth 
kiss where people are forgiven of their sins and all these things are happening in these signs and symbols and the show bread and the sprinkling of the blood on the altar. It's a place of the new creation. And so the artistic beauty of the trees and the fruit and the pomegranates and all this is designed to remind God's people that God is coming to earth and what he is doing there to atone for their sin is precisely to make a way for them to go back into the garden, to get back to new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. And so Basil's work reflects that on the inside of the tabernacle. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, new creation. And of course, uh, it's seen in no better place in the Old Testament than the, uh, the heavy and sobering um, and convicting and helpful and beautiful place of the prophets. Okay, uh, let me sum up the prophets for you. You got major prophets, right? Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, Daniel's kind of in there too. Then all the minor prophets, which I won't recite or my Sunday school teacher would be ashamed of me. Uh, But basically the story of the prophets is this, that Israel continues to be unfaithful. God continues to be faithful, to apply his spirit, his personal power and presence to them through the faithfulness of his grace. But they continue to fall. But God has made a promise, indeed, with himself, that he will not break his promise to show them grace and love. And so the prophets engage in these cycles of judgment and restoration, judgment and restoration. So Isaiah, right, it's a huge book. Woo! I mean, you could study Isaiah for the next five years and not get to the bottom of all the intricacies of the text historically and all their meaning and everything. But really, Isaiah is about cycles of judgment. God will not wince at sin. He will not be mocked. And then cycles of restoration, wherein God's personal presence enters into the life of his people Israel to turn their hearts from sin and brokenness and destruction back to himself, that they might be restored into right relationship through grace by his spirit. And of course, the message of the prophets is that we don't need more sacrifices, (laughs) We don't need more religiosity. We don't need more head knowledge and sort of propositions and things to know about God and who he is. What we need is a new heart. And man cannot give himself a new heart. The New Testament says that we have a heart of stone. Who will make it a heart of flesh? Paul says you were were dead in your sins and trespasses. Not that, you know, you were a pretty good person who just needed a little medicine. It's a difficult assessment, but this is what the scriptures teach. We were, we were at the bottom of the sea, man, with an anchor tied around our leg. We didn't need a little bit of medicine to make us better because we're you know, already pretty good. We needed the power of a resurrection to literally raise us from the dead and set us on the rock that could not be moved. This is the work of the Holy Spirit to provide for God's people a new heart. And in the Old Testament, they were just waiting. They were anticipating. Who's it going to be? What's he going to do? What's it going to look like? What is God going to do? Enter Jesus. And of course, we see in his baptism and his temptation in the garden, cross, resurrection, his entire life, his keeping the law so that he could procure righteousness for us, his death that bears God's wrath and atones for our sin, his resurrection, it's all because of the applied power of God through the Holy Spirit. But I really love this text in Luke chapter 14 as Jesus announces his ministry. He reads from Isaiah's scroll. And because of the Holy Spirit and the finished work of Christ, This can now be the work that we continue to do as the church. This can be the ongoing work of the church through the people of God because of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, verse 16. And Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. And this would be cited from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now Isaiah in those last chapters, especially Isaiah really 40 to the end of the book, but especially 50 through 66, it's all about the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation, right? Instead of ashes, a garment of joy, a headdress of beauty, resurrection, God's suffering servant. It's all there. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty freedom 
where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom to those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know what that means? The year of Jubilee. You know what that means? Everything is reset. Everything is made new. The work of the Holy Spirit is the work of new creation and recreation, first in our hearts, and now we are sent out to do that in the world. You see this in the book of Acts, of course. Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'll send my spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He empowers. He's an advocate so that when we're being condemned by the devil and accused and those voices sneak into your head to say, you know, you really can't be fully known and fully loved. God doesn't love you. He's going to give up on you. The Holy Spirit comes in. He gives you Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 6, that he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to see it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in the beginning of the, of the New Testament church, that they might go out now and share this gospel, not with geopolitical and ethnic Jews in one language, but every tribe and tongue and nation across the world in all languages. Indeed, that's what you see in Acts when tongues of fire descend upon the disciples and they start speaking in all these different languages. And some people who are there go, oh man, are they drunk? But no, they're not drunk. They are being empowered to speak in all the languages of the people who were gathered there from across the Roman Empire in Israel, in Jerusalem, for that festival, the Feast of Booths, which is now our Pentecost. They're filled with the Spirit so that they can go and speak in their own languages to now tell people in their own cities, in their own countries, the good news that God has not abandoned His creation to Tohu Vavohu. It's not just going to you know, degrade until it's eventually formless and void and wickedness will reign across the earth. No, God has promised that His Spirit has come, will come, and lives within us so that we can go out and actually be the hands and feet now of the new creation of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ and by the power of the personal presence of God, the Holy Spirit. And so as we finish here, I just want us to think about what are some ways that we can believe this and see this and know this in our own lives. How do you see the Spirit applying to you the finished work and benefits of Christ? You know, are you drawn to, to know God, to love Him, to be in His Word, to pray? Do you believe that you're forgiven even when you fail? Do you, do you speak, hear Him speaking over you as your advocate and your counselor? And how might the empowerment and the, the energy of God given to us and burning in our souls send us out into the world? Well, look at what Jesus says in Luke 4, right? We don't go out into Santa Fe and the surrounding regions to bring people more religion. We go to serve. We go to be a part of this upside-down kingdom to show people that power is made perfect in weakness, that it's better to give than to receive, that even in this weird time that we're in right now of, of COVID, the Holy Spirit says, don't fear if that looks like tohu vavohu to you. Don't fear. Instead, continue to, to scandalize all the idols of the world that would say, no, it's scarcity. I got to get mine. I got to hold it close. I, I don't know what's going to happen. Uncertainty and fear and anxiety. No, scandalize all those idols by believing that the new creation work of the Spirit isn't just still happening, but it is happening in power. So we can still be those who love and give and care for our neighbors and, and show them that you know, d disorder and anti-creation and chaos is not the end of the story, even if it feels that way in the moment. So I encourage us to do just that. Thank God for giving us the Holy Spirit and, and, and walk and live in His presence, His love, His forgiveness, even as we go to care for those who the Lord has put in our life. Thank you again for joining us for this video, and I hope you will have a wonderful day, and you'll come back to join us in our uh, next video and series.